Okay, uh, recording is on. So any questions before we start? I know there is one outstanding question as far as this process is. Uh, but any other question? <laughs> there are no questions, then let's get started. <clears throat> Basically, what is a function and what is the process? Uh, one of looking at function is, you know, you look at function as an individual building block, and then you look at the process as a series of activities that this, uh, you know, uses these individual building blocks. And the example that I can give you is uh, management process. You know, incident management process is a process uh, that we'll cover in detail when we talk about service operations. Really, uh, if anything happens with your service, uh, you bring in the incident management uh, incident management process. That process is kicked off, and uh, uh, is you try to figure out what is happening, and then you log the incident, and the service desk will, you know, uh, take a cost cut at trying to solve that incident. If you're able to solve it, that's good. If not, not what they'll do is they will escalate it to in level support or you know it's called by different names to the uh, on l2 uh, or you know the names are used but basically that you know what they're doing is giving it to someone who knows it better than them so that is uh, an escalation that is happening to either to an application team or a database team or a server team or a network team or a middle team Team, API team, so on and so forth, right? But the team in itself is called a function. So that is a team. The team has a role to play in incident management process. So if you look at the process, the process can touch upon various teams. It might not only be uh, application development team that is taking part in this uh, incident resolution. It might be application and database. Uh, it could be more than two teams, right? So the functions basically are part of the processes, the individual building blocks, but the process will go from one function to another function, right? Here. This means golden. I will assume this is clear. It's clear. Thank you. Okay. Does everybody remember where we were last time? Uh, which one was which one was the module that we covered last time? Are you only we need to pick up space then. Or are you ready? No, we go from module three. I it should be module four because the functions are in module four. Yeah, cover Racy also. Yeah. Yeah. Four. See? So I need to catch up. Don't test my memory, please. Now to module now. Last week you forgot to record. Yes, I am. I did press the recording button. Let's double check again. Okay. The recording is going on fine. Okay. No, sorry. Last time I forgot to press that button. Counting here. Again, I need to go to a different browser. Good day. How are you? I'm good. How are you? What the fuck?
going to start service strategy. Cool. Okay. So before we go into strategy, we need to understand a couple of terms, which is services capabilities and service assets. So what is a resource? Resource is something basically that gives you some kind of an advantage over your competitor. It could be your you know, financial asset if you have a lot of money sitting in your bank. Uh, that could be a resource if you have a you know better technology than your competitor. Um, it could be your resource, your physical presence in the location. You know, have a locational advantage that could be a resource or you know, if you have the right kind of a people, the right kind of a knowledge, uh, the right kind of a skill set, uh, that would also be the resource. And then the capabilities are the soft part of the organization. You know, it's a process that you have, it's a work maps that you have, it's a, a knowledge base that you have, it's any kind of a patent that you have, or you know, a customer loyalty that you command into the market. So the, all these things are abilities. Come together, what you get is a service asset. All of the service uh, strategy is basically to deploy service assets in such a way that we can generate the maximum return on investment for organizations. So what I'm saying over here is that you look at what kind of a technology do you have, you look at what kind of a people do you have, you look at you know, how much money you have sitting in a bank, and look at uh, you know uh, what, you know what is my reputation in the market, what is it I'm for? And what you will do is that you know, you're not offering the services based on uh, those, you know, combination of those criteria. You know that, okay, you know, maybe if I can take some money from the bank and invest in this technology, and you know, I can open a new data center, as an example. There is a data center in this part of the country, and if I open a data center over here, that will make more sense. So, so that's how uh, you are elevating uh, your market and you know, you're deploying your services. What's a strategy? There is a long definition of strategy over here, but my definition of a strategy is very simple. Uh, is what's your plan when the game? Game. Win the game or reach a goal, whatever you want to call it. Right? So, your basic plan, what are you, uh, you know, uh, uh, game plan that you have, right? So, that's a strategy. It could be, you know, we are going to compete in a certain market zone. Those markets could be either in terms of the service offerings or in terms of your geographical version only. Uh, that, uh, Company, or has been very very disciplined in uh, in the services that they are offering. You know, uh, as they started, they have been offering only one kind of a services, which is a database services. As you know, companies like Microsoft has expanded into many different areas. Microsoft started with an operating system and then came up with a product, Microsoft Office, and they built so many other products: SharePoint, MySQL, and so many more. It became a multi-product company. And they have, you know, acquired LinkedIn as well. Uh, so, you know, they are expanding in many different directions. Uh, if I remember it correctly, I think they made some investments in Nokia as well. They they, they bought Nokia, if I remember it correctly, uh, division, uh, something like that. It happened a couple of years ago. So uh, that's their plan to win in the market. You know, that's a game plan, but you have to think about, you know, what kind of resources do you have, and, you know, where do you want to go. So that strategy is all about. <clears throat> and you have to, <clears throat> you know, when thinking about strategy, there are some fundamental questions that you have to think about. One is, what is our business, you know, what, what kind of a business we are in? Uh, what who is our customer, right? Uh, and what is the customer value? Or what that we must do exceptionally well? Uh, what is the SWOT? Strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. 
what forces do we have? How does the market look like? Like, not sure. You know, the services that we should or shouldn't offer. So, starting with, you know, what is our business? You know, a very clear idea of uh, what I am in, right? Uh, if you know, I, I keep on coming back to the Humboldt College, and uh, you know, one business uh, which is post education uh, for Canadian and international students, and the OA customer exactly, you know, the people who are looking for post education, and this is not based upon any kind of an age profile because the people are younger, and some of the people are, you know. A little older than these younger folks. So we are customers by the age profile. They are defining their customers based on need. And the need is that I'm looking for a post secondary education in the GTA area so that I can get a job. Right? And what's the customer value? In our case it would be the quality education that is what the customer values. And what was do exceptionally well to be leader in the market? Uh, so first of all, very basic, uh, you know, no dinner is deliver a very good quality action. But all of that, you need to have your support services uh, working as well. You know, support services like career counseling, your library, your workshops, your industry visits, uh, your actions with the industry experts, uh, gym swimming. Pull those kinds of things basically add to the whole learning experience that your people are having, right? So, this is what, what are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? Some of you might know, for, and this might be new for some of you. Uh, strengths are basically internal to the organization, and opportunities and threats are external to the organization. <clears throat> Strengths, you know, strengths could be that we have a great faculty, we have a good brand name. Um, you know, the weaknesses, the weaknesses, I won't say weaknesses, I term it as a limitation, and the limitation I would say would be <clears throat> that we are located only in GTA. We have a physical presence in, Alice in Canada. So that is the one big limitation that we are dealing with right now. What is in the market? Well, there are a lot of opportunities in the market. In the market, we know a lot of international students are coming uh, all over. So we can open up branches. We we'll tie up with the other, it's like the way we have tied up with the University of Gulf. So, you know, we came up with a new institute called University of Gulf Humber. Um, so we do those kinds of things, right? We can have a campus on the western side of Canada now. Okay. So uh, those are the opportunities. What is a threat? A threat, I would say, is not from a direct competition. Um, with the competition, you know, you have a competition. College in the GTA, you are in a direct competition with them. The threat is from the you know company like Coursera or On Academy or or MIT Open Courseware, where people have an opportunity to go in and you know get the learning that they want. Uh, watching some videos or taking some individual courses, they can get what they want, right? So those I would say would be the threats. Courses, as I mentioned earlier, we have a good faculty. We have probably money sitting in the bank. Um, you know, uh, good infrastructure, especially in the GTA region, uh, though we the resources. And if we look at the market, I would say the market is expanding. I see the international students, a lot of international students are coming to Canada. So, from that perspective, it is an expanding market. It is not a contracting market. And you have to be disciplined about the services that you are offering in the market. So Humber College is, you know, very clear that they are not a medical school. Even though they, uh, they, they do offer some courses related with medical, 
uh, you know, nursing, nursing courses available, but it is not a medical school. They do not train doctors, so they are very clear about that. Not a pure engineering institute where the thing that you see is an engineering, but it's more of an applied technology than a research-based institute, right? So very clear about where they stand and what kind of the services they are offering in the market. I think that you have to be uh, uh, a little bit more sensitive to is that are we providing technology or are we providing the services? So you're not in the business of a technology until and unless technology is your business, right? Uh, Technology if you are Google. Technology is your business if you are Oracle. Technology is your business if you are Microsoft because that's the whole business. You know, they come up with a new technology uh, day in and day out. It's a business. But for other businesses, they rely upon the technology to run their businesses. So the core goal of the organization should be to add the core services and to the help of technology in, in, in expanding those services, right? But fall into this kind of a fallacy uh, that uh, you know, technology is their business because they are heavily reliant upon technology uh, to get the thing done. So careful that you don't fall into that kind of uh, you know, fallacy. And here we used an example where, you know, if you go to a car mechanic and you have to get a couple of things done, let's say that you need to get the oil changed, you need to get the brake changed, and you need to get your car painted as well. And, you know, car mechanic at the end of the day gives you three different bills. They're going to say, you know, I like it. Give me one bill. Uh, let bill, what is the cost for oil change? What is the cost for brake repair? Is the cost to paint my car, and uh, what is the labor? What are the taxes? What is the warranty? What is the guarantee? And then uh, give me one consolidated bill. So that is how an integrated view should be there. But in reality, you might have seen in your experiences when the business needs to talk, they de they don't know who to talk with. Whether it's the application team that they should engage, whether it's a database team that they should engage. Uh, whether it's a network team that they should engage, sometimes they, they, they are lost in that confusion that the IT presents to them. It should be that we should provide a one seamless integrated view to the business so it is much easier for them to interact with us. I, similarly, I have another example of a GE, which, which is my favorite companies, but you can replace it with any other company who has an international operation. Let it be the banks, let it be your insurance companies, um, you know, let it be the airlines uh, or, or any other, uh, maybe the hotel industry which has an international presence. The point I'm trying to make over here is that, you know, um, the companies operate in the different parts of the world. They have to follow the law of the land and a particular country. And that becomes, you know, from an, uh, from an IT perspective, <clears throat> Your options becomes very complex. As an example, you know, let's say you're, you're a bank and you are working in, uh, let's say, only US and Canada. But application that opens checking account in Canada might not be applicable in US because of the different laws or the way uh, the banking systems work over there. So that adds another layer of a complexity. Uh, into environment, so you have to be careful about that one. Uh, you know, service characteristics coming back to, you know, value, we have talked about the value earlier. Uh, you know, value defined by the customer, uh, we, we know this thing very clearly. Uh, it has to be cost justifiable, it has to me needs and objectives of uh, your customers and value changes over time. Um, a couple of times, but I'll go, go it over very quickly again. Um, customer is the one who is defining the value 
Uh, you are offering a service, but what is the real value of that service will be defined by uh, the customer. And value to my mind is a perception uh, of services, you know, of the benefits that they have realized by consuming your service. That is what uh, our value about. And again, if the product or the services that you're offering is too expensive or too complex to use, uh, then probably it's not fully justifiable uh, to the person who actually wants to consume these things. And need the, need the, needs and objectives of the people, and as seen earlier, the value does change over time. Many value, a couple of things that you can, you know, think about or brainstorm. First one is to start with the why. Why am I doing what I am doing? But until and unless you are not clear about that why, you might not be able to sit for very long in the business. Now, by that, a very good book, the name Start With Why. Uh, if you get a chance to read it, um, if you like reading, I recommend this book right, by Simon Sinek. Uh, take a case of a humble college, and you know, let's, uh, I'm just going to make up something. Let's say that we believe that uh, an educated society is a progressive society. We, edu uh, we believe that an uh, educated society produces responsible citizens. We believe that. that you know, an educated society lives with integrity and and in harmony, right? And we are in a business of providing education, so we believe that by providing education, uh, we are at the end of the day helping in a nation building, we are helping in building a society which is just, which is uh, social, uh, which believes in uh, integrity and, and compassion. So if that why is clear, you know, we'll operate differently. But I believe that, you know, I need to pro people because they want something and I have a rare, uh, you know, rare uh, offering to offer, then that why is not going to last for a very long period of time. Because the moment somebody finds an alternative or a replacement for for your service, and they will definitely find you know a cheaper alternative or a better alternative uh, in the due course of the time. Then people will get turned away from you for sure. And questions you know we have touched upon earlier: how what services do we provide? What the value that we provide? What is the cost? Or you know what is the price point at which we are providing these services? So. that you can think about. And note over here that this slide is a wrong slide. Uh, you know, number five, slide number nine um, is a wrong slide. Uh, it is saying over here is that utility is fitness for use. It is not this the case. Utility is basically fitness for purpose, right? So what and utility got swapped in this slide. Utility is basically fitness for purpose, which has warranty is your fitness for use. Okay. Coming earlier, uh, and this slide is coming back. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, regarding the services in Humber College, uh, if we think about uh, expanding the services like certificates, get additional certificate for our students because they are the value you improve or incoming improve for the future instead of thinking to go to outer colleges or other to get a certificate this is one of my if it's reasonable you can definitely expand your services right uh, Companies have done it uh, so uh, 
I'll give you an example of a Rogers. Uh, how many of you have a plan from Rogers? But if you have a plan from Rogers, they will try to sell you an insurance or something like that where they will say $14 a month if you, you know, plus $14 a month. Then if your device is stolen, we will make sure that we will give you the device back. I will give you a new device or the same device uh, and also protect data, something like that. But basically the point is they are expanding their services to wherever they can expand, you know. Their services, telecommunication, they sell you the handset, they sell you the pen. But now also selling you the insurance that if your handset gets broken or it is stolen or if you, or if you lose it somewhere, you know, you can buy our insurance policy and uh, we can provide you with a new device. Similarly, what you are saying is uh, it, it's a good thought. Um, you know, we can expand into those directions because we are already a lot of educational services and what you said is just an extension of uh, what we're doing. So it's very much doable. In, we're on to the next one. So enabling services, enhancing services, and service package. These are of various kinds. Uh, in four names that we gave to the services, and I'll explain this concept by using an example. Uh, <clears throat> let's say that I took a print I'm in a Humber College I'm on one of the computers in the lab. So, and you know, the printer will print a paper, and the printer is on the side of the hallway. Uh, so, it print whatever I have requested it to print. Service that I'm using over here is a print service, right? That print command that I have given, I'm using a print service. But the print service cannot work if there is no wireless service. The from my computer to the printer is not going to work if there is wireless or a wireline connection. If that connection is not there, then core service cannot exist. So that is what is the difference between what is a core service and what is enabling services. A core service uh, cannot exist without the enabling service. Enabling service is basically an icing on the cake, and enhancing service could be a double side print. Uh, or get a message that your, your print job will be ready in 20 minutes on printer number this and tray number three. Right? That is an enhancing service. And when you put together everything, uh, you are offering to the customers is a service package. Example again, coming back to the Humber College, uh, the course service is the post-secondary education that we provide. The link service is all the technology that we are using is an enabling service. Uh, imagine we don't have a wireless connections. Imagine we don't have a blackboard. Imagine we don't have. A so that our lesson for today wouldn't have been possible without the support of all these enabled services, right? If these services go down, then the core service will not exist. It becomes very, very difficult, if not impossible, to to keep on running with the core service when the enabling services is not there. Enhancing services could be your career counseling. It could be the industry wizards. It, it could be. Uh, some other kind of offerings that I'm including as a part of your uh, actually, uh, you know, I'll give you a training on the cultural sensitivities. I'll give you the training on the various cultures within the world, right? And put them together and it becomes a package for you. And then you can go and subscribe to that package which in, in our terms is going to be the course. So that's the difference 
it's between core enabling uh, enhancing so when you put them together what you are basically creating is a service package discussion question think of institutes institute that you have you are or have been a part of list all list list at least one example each of a core enabling and enhancing service providing for your answer so why why you believe you know these this right thing any silence so is move on then so strategy is define the market you look at the market and uh, you look at you know whether this is an expanding market or whether this is a contracting market there are some tools that you can use swot is one tool Order forces is another tool. Uh, is another tool. Pest is not mentioned here, but Pest is another strategy level tool that you can um, basically uh, to evaluate the market. Uh, some of the markets are expanding. Some of the markets are contracting. Uh, if bank is an example, the retail channel is basically uh, is you know it's it's not growing at the same pace at which the digital channel is growing. I mean to say is, uh, you know, the number of the transactions in the in the branches are the same, or very marginally, or they're easy. Right? There's not a huge growth in that particular side of the business. So if you are a bank, you will be very, very cautious about opening a new branch because the trend is changing. Consume, consuming more and more of the content either on the internet or on their mobile devices. So the, the number of the digital transactions for the bank is growing at a very, very fast pace. You have to look at the market, you know, whether it's an expanding market, contracting market, uh, set that the customer's value in that market, right? Or to create a new market uh, in and of itself, I have a deep respect for uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, he came up with a you know nice, uh, no idea of coming up with a device which is in between a desktop and a laptop, and we call it iPad. He launched iPad. He also launched a uh, uh, market, and I don't know whether it was iPad or iPhone which was launched earlier, but essentially. The concept of uh, educations was a very novel idea, was very innovative idea. And he was able to create a market, a new market, uh, you know, between uh, the domains of a desktop and the domains of a laptop. So then, you know, latched up to this thing and they started uh, with their Android uh, market as well. So that's what you can do. You know, you can start your own market if there is none existing. And what you have to then do is develop the offering. You know, what kind of a services I am want to offer in this market? What does the service look like? So you have to start thinking about all those things. And once you have, uh, you know, thought about providing those uh, services. Are you a good idea? You got the right approvals from the people who need to approve your services. Then you need to do this. You need to start deploying your strategic assets, which means that now you're taking your money, now you're taking your resources, now you're taking your infrastructure, now you're putting everything together to build your services and to market your services. And this is basically the execution phase. This is where uh, you are actually offering the services in the market, and you offer those services in the market. Of course, you're going to get some feedback from the customers. You have to you have to act on that feedback. You have to have the right kind of uh, the 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 mechanisms in place or the feedback loops in the place, so that when you receive the feedback, it can flow to the uh, 
to destination and the right action can be taken based on that feedback. Hi, so far. Okay, let's take a five minute break and we will come back at 6.45 and then we will jump onto the module. In what I'm gonna do is I'm going to upload an assignment for you. I'm just screen over here for a moment. I'm going to act for a second. I disconnect in the sense that not share my screen with you, uh, but we'll still be here. So we'll come back at six. Five. Get started again. I have turned on the recording again my screen so on to the next module and talk about assignment as well okay so what are the process within a service strategy First process is a service portfolio management process. And uh, the port, you know, what is a service portfolio? The question is uh, a service portfolio. And the service portfolio basically uh, includes three things. It's, it's a list of all the services uh, that you used to provide in the past that you are providing today and that you will be providing in the future. So it's a past, present, and future, all the services included. And this is what the service portfolio is all about. Services that you're going to provide in future, these services are called the services in pipeline, or it's called a pipeline, right? It's called a service pipeline sometimes. Telling uh, your customer is that this service is not available today, but at a certain point in future this service will be available to you again example of a humble career you know let's say that they are starting a course in 2018 and start advertising about the course right now they say you know this course will be available in winter 2018 or fall 2018 or summer 2018 uh, you know whatever case might be uh, but it start uh, the addressment, the marketing of the service or the course in, in this case right now. So it will be considered as a part of a pipeline. They're not currently offered, but this will be offered sometime in future. future. Part is service catalog. And these are all your operational services. These are the services that the customers can use right now. They are available to the customers today. And we have the retired services as well. And you have to maintain the retired services because of the law sometimes, or because you know there are some other you know customers who are still on the service uh, haven't you know graduated to the 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 other services. I can give you my personal example: the cell phone plan that I have from. Uh, Fido is not currently offered anymore. I'm on on their retired service. Uh, I am the customer on their retired services. Uh, the service is not actively, uh, or this plan is not actively offered to the new consumers anymore. So you got get it by <clears throat> by going to their website. And services. So that's a service portfolio. And the goal of the service portfolio is to, you know, look at what resources do I have, what capabilities do I have, and to create a healthy balance between you know, the future investments and the investments in the present services and, you know, the investments in the, in the areas where you need to maintain your existing services. So that's the goal of a service portfolio management that, you know, where do I in my resources. And goal is basically to, 
generate the maximum return for the organization. Wiping the risks is acceptable level. The risks have to be kept at an acceptable level. It's almost impossible to eliminate the risks. So there are some industries where you know we have a high risk tolerance. You know, uh, by high risk tolerance means that, that uh, you know, I'm in the ice cream shop and you order an ice cream and I gave you the wrong one, right? You tell me, again, this is not the ice cream that I ordered. And very quickly give you the new one. There is not much of a damage that can happen there. Of the customer experience would be ruined. Uh, but I can still give you, you know, maybe I'll say, you know, this ice cream is complimentary. This is free for you because I made a mistake. Hope that will, you know, uh, cool down your nerves a little bit. But there are, there are some industries where risk tolerance is very low. That's one kind of an industry, you know, where you cannot expect that, okay, let's say that I am transferring money from your account my account to your account, and, and and it ends up in somebody else's account. You will be upset, I will be upset, and the person who is getting the money might be happy, but eventually they will have to return it. Right? So the risk tolerance in that kind of work is quite low. The risk tolerance in, in, in the medical industry is very, very low because the consequences are very, very serious. There are some industries which are, by definition, a risky business. For example, launching a satellite into a space is quite a risky business. It's either a pass or it's either a fail. There is no in-between. It's quite black and white. Uh, if the rocket lifted well and if the, you know your satellite is placed into the right orbit, satellite is functioning well, this is success. If there's a problem with the rocket, a problem with the launch, and if, you know you have to abort the launch, then there's a lot of money that is at stake. There's a lot of resources. And the time that you spend is on stake. But how the nature of the business is, right? No other way, right? At least right now, launch the satellites in the space other than to put them onto the rocket and you know launch that rocket and. That's a complex process in itself, right? Goes to have a look at uh, your investments. Where do I need to make any investments, and how do I manage the risk? And the last, basically, uh, I have you know talked about it basically to get the maximum return on the investment. For the that's the goal of the service portfolio. So we talked about it, you know, the services that will be offered into future called a service pipeline. Microsoft usually does a very good job with this thing. They will, you know, release their product in a beta version. They will say this is a beta version of the product. This is not the final product. Uh, we continue to play uh, with it, and you know we are looking to test this product. This way, uh, we are able to get a feedback from the customers very quickly uh, without damaging the reputation of the company or reputation of the product. Because they have already said that this is a beta version, this is not a complete version. And based upon the feedback that they have received from this community. Uh, which is very enthusiastic to use the new products. Uh, what Microsoft then does is, you know, take in the feedback, incorporate that feedback, and release a much more, much and much more refined product into the market. Right? That's just taking advantage of your service pipeline. This is to that. They launch a cell phone and they will say, okay, now the price from today, uh, cell phone is not available right now in your country. It will be available in two weeks, three weeks.
takes from the lunch date. But we are taking in the pre-orders. If you order now, you get it from maybe for a discount. I guess they will offer any discount or not. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, making the use of the service pipeline uh, to generate the revenues up early, generate some excitement about the services. Uh, this is basically a catalog of services you're offering. It's good to of you know a restaurant menu or 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 or, or a college catalog, right? Down all the services that you're currently offering. Uh, also, list how customers can order that service. What is going to be the price point for that service? Um, will be included in that service. So all those things are part of your service catalog. And the last one is the retired services. These are not only marketed to, uh, to the general public. This might be as an internal part of your portfolio. Uh, but something uh, which is not going to be uh, too not uh, very easy. Right? The, So in terms of a process, what is the process, right? It's through a couple of the phases. The first one is the defined phase, where you define the services, you list down all the services that you think you can provide in the market. So you don't look at any kind of a constraints. Uh, it's open forum. You let imagination run wild. Uh, is that you can think of what does make sense. I list down those as a potential candidate uh, that we offered into the market. But then what you do is you pick a little bit more rational. You start analyzing your services. You start analyzing the market a little bit. You do kind of a cost-benefit analysis. And then you will say, you know, out of these 10 services that I'm thinking about, only three makes the cut for the cost-benefit analysis. The other one are either too expensive or you know they don't own a kind of a value that our customers will appreciate. So you then fold them down and you will start developing the three services uh, that make sense. But before you start developing those services, you basically have to take them to a moving body. Uh, it's a top level of people in the organization who are the approvers of the service or you know uh, or, or or this uh service pipeline uh, sorry service uh, portfolio for that matter uh, if the uh, investment uh, it looks good then the, yes we we are on board uh we go ahead and start developing the service and launch the service if not then they will say okay you know what this does not make sense this was a good business Yes, but this is not the great business case. So you might go back and improve uh, your business case. Right? Business case is approved. What you do is that you will charge that service, which means that uh, you know downstream processes like designing the services and other, uh, other processes can be kicked off now. Those processes will be rolled out and. At the point when the service, is basic, service basically becomes a part of the charter, that's when you know you can start advertising. Uh, if before this point, then you run a risk that you will not be offered uh, to the market, and you might be making some false promises to the consumers, right? Make sure that we are recording well. Of course, the recording is good. Okay, next process is the demand management. And uh, the goal of the demand management is to basically look at how uh, the demand is varying. And demand can vary either on a daily basis or it can vary on a weekly basis. And sometimes the demand varies on a yearly basis. But there are a certain factors that might end up 
or, you know, affecting the demand. If there is any kind of a political activity going on, if there's any kind of a supporting activity going on, or if there's any kind of a musical activity going on, that ends to affect the demand of certain kind of a services. Well, you know, there is a musical uh, festival happening in Toronto. Then the demand for, you know, maybe the hotels or uh, those kinds of services might go up in Toronto. But it's going to have any effect nationally. It's not going to have any effect on the you know, hotel industry in Ottawa, hotel industry in Calgary, because musical festivals are not going on there. have to look at, you know, uh, what are the factors which are influencing the demand and how the demand is fluctuating and evolving over time. Uh, if demand for the utilities uh, can go up, up upon two factors. One is the utilization rate. Uh, uh, utilization rate is... Uh, Daytime. Uh, these are open and they are using the utilities as at the same time. Households are also consuming some part of the utilities, right? So that means the demand for the util utilities goes up during uh, a lot, but most of the businesses are open for you know eight to ten hours a day, sometimes twelve hours a day, but for other ten, twelve, fourteen hours a day, these businesses shut down. And there is no demand for the services anymore. So uh, one kind of a variation. Second variation that the utilities in particular can see is the change uh, in weather conditions. If there is an extreme weather, whether extreme cold or whether it's extreme heat, uh, and then see that the utilities consumption goes up, especially the hydro. Uh, if it's a hot summer afternoon and you know the temperature just goes up uh, be using more of your air conditioning that means more pressure on the hydro if it becomes much colder in the winter season then uh, you know you will be using your furnace a little bit more than usual that's more pressure on the hydro and more pressure on the natural gas because more furnace is burning a lot of natural gas, right? So things can influence your demand, and uh, you have to look at what kind of a demand it is and how the demand is fluctuating. Is it fluctuating on a on a day basis or a week basis? Uh, and again, you know, underlying factors that are affecting the demand. And goal of demand management is basically to, you know, take information uh, of how the demand is fluctuating and pass on these the, the, the information to uh, the site so that they can get prepared for it. The example on this slide is not correct. Uh, I believe uh, they have stopped this practice many years ago. Uh, but it's a time, I believe, when Walmart used to suspend their services during the Christmas season, because they want to focus a lot on uh, serving the demand, uh, the demanding the customers Christmas season for for the you know, goods and services goes up quite a lot. You know, the companies want to you know focus all their resources on the selling part versus uh, you know. Uh, the returns and the exchanges part, but I don't think this is applicable anymore. So please disregard this thing. But the goal is basically to meet that demand in a cost-effective manner. So one thing we can say is that if the companies knows that the demand is going to go up, especially the utilities, then won't they build a capacity? Or yes, you know, we have seen if we deal with the telecommunication companies, you go out and buy a plan. The entry level plans will give you a lesser number of daytime minutes versus uh, a much uh, higher priced plan. 
And what basically the companies are trying to do is uh, they are trying to shift your demand from high peak time to the gate time, right? Uh, always try to maintain a healthy balance between uh, the peak time demand and uh, the demand that they can actually serve by building the right capacity if they build the capacity based upon the peak hour demand then that, that peak hour demand is going to re remain there for a couple of hours only but uh, for the other time of the day or other time of the night the capacity is sitting idle and the business are not generating any return on that uh, that investment so that's why they take shift uh, consumption of the services from peak, uh, peak time frame to the non-peak. That's why your you know cell phone plans or your utility rates are much higher when uh, in the day. And they are much lesser during the night. And this is what we call is differential pricing. We try to manage the demand by using a mechanism called differential pricing, which is basically, sorry, which is basically, uh, you know, charging a different rate for the same service depending upon the time of the day when you consume the service. So, you know, your hydro during the day is, you know, worse than the hydro that you will get during the night. The quality of the electricity that you're getting during the day and during the night is going to be the same. So why is it that your hydro company is charging you more during the day during the night for the same amount of consumption? Basically, very clear that they cannot build the capacity and they want you to move uh, you know, your demand from you know peak period to the off-peak period. But then the demand, which is, you know, uh, which is a permanent demand, the demand that is not going to go away, the demand that is consistently, and there's a pattern in demand, and we call it patterns of business activity. Let's take an example of Canada as a country. Allow about 250 to 300,000 people to come in every single year and become the permanent residents of Canada. So that is the demand that is not going to go away. Maybe one percent of the two percent of the people who come into Canada goes back to their respective countries, but most of them are going to stay here and raise their families here and you know live for for their life in Canada. So clearly we know what kind of a roads we we need what kind of an infrastructure do we need? What kind of a schools do we need? What kind of a hospitals do we need? Uh, uh, you know, demand is it is not a variable demand. That is a very steady demand, and if to build the capacity for that on, because in that case, capacity is not going to remain high. The permanent, uh, uh, you know, patterns of business activity that we uh, look at. Last process in the service strategy is the financial management, and as the name indicates, it you know, it at the judicious or the wise use of your financial resources. It cares about uh, that you are using your of financial resources in such a way that you are maximizing the returns uh, for your organization. And the, some of the key terms that you need to know uh, uh, management is accounting. Accounting account basically tracks money. Uh, you know, when an organization, uh, there are expenses, and you need to understand uh, that how many I'm spending on what kind of activities, right? And activity-based costing, by the way. So 
So you need to understand how much I'm paying uh, to employees, how much is I'm paying to the utility companies, how much is my uh, you know, procurement cost, how much is my, you know, uh, other costs, so on and so forth. Understand that, right? And if you have that idea, then it will help you to build your chargeback model. If you have a good understanding of, you know, where your costs are, then maybe you can do some cost-cutting initiatives as well. It helps you to build a chargeback model, which we will just talk about in a quick second. So then it's budgeting and forecasting. So budgeting is basically allocating money for a particular cause or a particular uh, purpose, right? So let's say that you are renovating your home. You can say that the budget I have is for painting the house. This much is for the repairs. This much is for my new furniture, and so on and so forth. So. You basically create some different buckets of money, enable them, and you call it a budget, right? And the budgets are typically developed based on the forecast, and the forecasts will come from analyzing your demand. So now you see, you know, all these processes are trying to build an interrelationship with each other. They're not the isolated processes. They don't uh, exist in isolation. So the forecasting will tell you, you know, what is it that you're looking at, uh, how much, how many new customers can come in, uh, or, you know, where is your market going, or what kind of a demand be for your services, right? And then you will budget the money accordingly. And thing is basically this is where you will put your chargeback model into place. This is where you know you're going to say, okay, this is how much it is costing me to run business. This is how much it is costing me to assist um, to the customers, and I need to recover my money because I am a profitable enterprise. So you will have a different kinds of chargeback models. Uh, take the example of a cell phone companies. Uh, at the we have a pay per use model, you know, pay as you use. You don't pay if you don't use. But then the cost per call or the cost per minute or the cost per second is going to be quite high. But the other very end of that spectrum is what you find is an unlimited plans. For X amount of dollars that you pay them up every month, can get an unlimited data, unlimited calling, unlimited text, unlimited internet usage, so on and so forth, right? Uh, so you have to see what kind of a chargeback model models it to work for you in your organization, right? Based on how I am going to recover my money, right? As we have seen some change to in the trends, people are moving more from a product-based organizations to the service-based organizations. Microsoft is a classic example. Uh, they have Microsoft Office both as a product as well as a service. Uh, Office 365 is a service. As a, as a product is a product in, in, in itself. Uh, so that's how you have to think about, you know, chargeback model. I can give you another example. Uh, the Humber College comes up with a new formula and they can tell you, you know, what uh, dollars you can take any number of the courses in the next five years. Right? So, but that amount is quite a substantial amount. Let's say, let's say that you are paying ten dollars today for the whole course, as an example. They will, say, you know, for thirteen dollars or for fifteen dollars, you can get as many courses as you want in the next five years. But you are not paying ten, but you are paying fifteen. So that means college is getting more out of you. But then at the same time, it is also giving you an opportunity to 
get more out of the college as well. It's same thing as unlimited data, right? Uh, the case charge to more, you get unlimited amount of data, unlimited amount of calling, uh, did other services, but you end up paying more. Do you end up actually consuming an unlimited amount of data? I don't know. Do you end up making an unlimited amount of the calls? I don't know. Right? Uh, but then you can offer it as one of the chargeback models. Uh, of the financial management is a cost classification, which is direct versus indirect, and then capital operational. So direct cost the one that you can pinpoint to really clearly and say that you know this is a cost for that particular item. If you have bought a new server, a new router, and cable, uh, you can very well uh, point to that and say, okay, this is how much it costs. Me, but there are some indirect costs as well. Indirect costs are your wages, your lawyer fees, your taxes, your utility bills. All these are part of your indirect costs, and it's difficult to pinpoint how much of the indirect cost basically is consumed by, let's say, one server. Right. And the other kind of a class cost classification is capital versus operational. Sometimes we call it capex and opex as well. So capital cost is uh, the amount that you spend on an asset that will last for more than one year. And the year over here is usually a calendar year. Right? So if making the capital investments, then there are some provisions in the tax law that you can depreciate those assets, your capital assets, and you can reduce your tax liability by using depreciation as one of the uh, tools available to you to reduce your uh, standing taxes. Right? Typically, uh, these assets have to last more than one year. Operating cost, as I mentioned earlier, is your uh, cost, it's your utilities, it's your wages, it's your loss, it's your taxes, all those things combined, uh, your operational cost. What categories that you have to, to think, especially if you're in Canada, is called spread, S-R-E-D. It's research, I think, education and development. And CRA basically gives you some kind of a tax discount if you are working on something that qualifies under under the strategic guidelines. Now, I remember the guidelines, but if you're doing any kind of a scientific research and spending money on that research, you know, this money could be classified as an operational, there might be a possibility that you can go to the ERA and say, you know what, I have a business case that our tax liabilities should be reduced. Right? And the last part of the service strategy is your business relationship management. And business relationship management basically acts as a bridge between uh, between IT and business. So it understands the needs and the urgency of the business. It passes on the, you know, the demand and the drivers of the demand uh, to IT so that IT can get prepared about the demand or the fluctuations in the demand. And also passes on, you know, other information from a business side to the IT side. So IT is getting prepared and it's aligned with the needs of the business so they can get ready a business needs them. On the other hand, it is also, uh, you know, it also acts as an advocate for IT on the business side. So they take uh, what's happening in the IT world, or the challenges that in the IT world are, you know, the developments in the IT world, and then they will share those things with the business so that the business is aware of what is happening in the IT world. If you're working on a project, you know, uh, there's a high-pitched conversion 
something that starts to happen. The goal of our bishop management is to make sure that there are proper channels of escalations available so that people, rather than pointing fingers at each other, can make use of those channels and uh, uh, you know, can communicate uh, in, in, and get a resolution to their uh, issue or whatever is bothering them. And if there is an agency that needs to be expressed, then there is a proper mechanism and there is a proper channel through which they can go in and express that urgency. Other business is expressing that urgency to the IT or is expressing that urgency to the business, right? There are a couple of uh, pop quests. You can do it on your own. And quickly recapping what we have covered today as service portfolio management, amount management, financial management, and business relationship management. I'll check the chat. Uh, let if there are any questions on the chat. Uh, if you have any questions, please fire them right now. One and two from the group discussion board, I can't find them. Yes, Adnan, uh, they expire after a week or so of posting. Post them, I will send out uh, a communication. And uh, both will remain active for a week after a week those are not available anymore so what your other questions uh, let me bring the assignment uh, for you uh, if you have everything you need uh, I don't know how the assignment is going to show up for you but you click on the assignment sorry yeah. It should be somewhere down here. This is the assignment. Basically, I have it over here. Again, the assignment is basically a figment of my imagination. This is something that I'm thinking uh, in mind. I don't know if these things are happening at Humber College or not. Uh, but I have created a scenario for you. And the scenario is, you know, uh, Humber College primary post-entry education. In the recent years, they have started offering advanced level courses in technology and nursing and paramedics and so on and so forth. Top management feels that they can enter into the executive education market. Ex education for purposes is defined as an on-job training taken to boost up the skills and the people who are already working. So. Of the Humber College management, as an example, might be thinking is, you know what, great faculty, we can maybe use uh, services of the faculty to expand our services. It's like some of, you know, one of you mentioned in the, in the today that, you know, maybe we can offer the certificates, but I'm going into a little bit different direction, but again, it's the concept of the services. Entering into the executive education market, and the executive education is basically people already have a job, they want to improve uh, their skill sets. Uh, so, what, uh, what is this, uh, what are services that we can provide to them, right? And we, we can provide them with the courses, and that's what the question is all about, you know, what should be the quest strategy? while entering into the executive education market. So you can say that, you know, we have a very good uh, teach on the nursing side. They have a very good uh, uh, processes and procedures. Uh, we go to the hospitals and retrain the nurses, right? That could be your, you know, target offering. So today, which is your second question, but then the question is, are you going to target all the hospitals at once, or are you going to target hospitals only in the GTA first? Right. And what is going to be your chargeback model? Are you going to charge based upon training wires or a group of nurses, or you know, are you going to send your people into hospitals 
and train them there or are you going to bring these nurses into the Humber College and you want, you're going to train them there. So there will be the various ways in which you can build up your assignment and think about the chargeback model. This is basically how you're going to recover money for uh, for the services that you are offering. Uh, then individual assignment, uh, write uh, your name and student ID at the top of the first page so that I know who is submitting it. Uh, it should not be more than three pages. I think three pages is more than enough. I am not interested in reading any novels. And uh, you have to submit this electronically. Even if you feel like doing it by hand, after doing it by hand, please scan it and send it to me. As long as I can read your handwriting, we are good. I scan your handwriting and uh, you know send it to me. Uh, any questions regarding the assignment or what we have covered so far? No. I'm good with the assignment. It is a week from now, so which is, I believe, 13th of October. Yeah. Can you go a little bit louder? No, it's good. Yeah. Because I sent your email, I'm, I'm more of uh, speaking to him on all master students while changing a schedule for this class. So you have sent me in mail, but unfortunately we cannot change the schedule because my weekends are quite busy. I am on the board of directors of two organizations, and one of them actually meets on this. So even I do have some volunteer work to do on Saturdays. If we could have discussed this at the start of the course, then. Well, unfortunately, at the time, we will have to live with this time frame. No, of the course, it's going to remain the same. So, So arrive late where yeah, on Saturday we have any time. We so our online classes is only Saturday. So two classes and Saturday and no any time to arrive. That is well seven students arrive late when the third class arrive was uh three three arrive late on Saturday because of you. True, I'm talking to the whole class, not especially you. When I say you, I mean the whole class. So the class are isolated on Saturday because they have a six to eight class. Saturday? Saying is basically on Saturday we have an online class in the morning. If the and then that at noon, 12.30, and on campus a class that starts at 2.30. Yeah. So, between 30 and 2.30 people find that it's not enough time to make it from home to college. They go to online classes on Saturday so they don't have to leave home, and we take the, the campus class to Friday, which, which is what we always do. We always go to, to school at, at 6 every day. And we put both of the online classes on Saturday so we don't have to leave home. Uh, okay. okay, so you want to swap my class with the other class so that you have the other class on Friday and then classes on Saturday? Is that what yes. you're saying? Yes. 
Yes, exactly. Two online classes on Saturday. We don't Saturday, have to Saturday, live the past. So one online, online class? From 1 p.m. or any time after 1 p.m. We are available. It didn't have problem as as here now. We start Linux from eight at twenty. Then two uh, two thirty p.m. So most many students are right and tired. So we only online classes on uh, Saturday. So we can manage our time after one p.m. A time uh, uh, late, not uh, maybe six, seven, eight, uh, four time. That's all the day. That's <sighs> I have to look into my schedule and I also have to talk with the professor. I can tell you very honestly, the pay of this thing happening is quite low. We'll try to help you as much as I can. Yeah, all we need yeah. is you but need a favor from you. Yeah. If you can help, then it's perfect. It's good. If you can't, then but yeah. I, but I can't guarantee. And if it is going to happen, and it might happen early on Sunday. I mean, AM kind of a thing. Keep the rest of my Saturday open for my other activities. I cannot have it in the middle of the day. My family time as well. Yeah. yeah, I already have a class in the morning, so I don't think that will work. Then you know, I want to have a class from, let's say, 8 to 10 in the morning. I'm done with my classes, and I have the rest of the day to spend with the family. Yeah. Uh, right, so yeah. that's how I'm thinking. Yeah. If, yeah. if possible. So the coordinator is that Linux afternoon, no problem. Our problem is only, only we need to. Uh, no, you have to at the same, uh, uh, same time. No, no you have to. For us to move. The thing is, you have to think about me as well because I cannot have a class in the middle of the day. I cannot tell my family that I am not available to you on say because we cannot plan to go out or anything. True. Yeah, true. And the same for the Saturday evening as well. That's the only time that you can, you know, not sleep on your sleeping time. If anything, that can happen. If anything, uh, we have to discuss and the pro it gets moved, it will get, it, it's going to move to early Saturday morning if that works for you. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. If it moves to uh, Saturday morning, but still, uh, still, uh, since we have a class on, on uh, we have a class of Linux on Saturday morning. If you could uh, discuss it with um, the course coordinator, uh, hopefully he will speak to uh, our Linux uh, instructor. Uh, if you could manage, like, uh, if he could swap, like, um, you know, like your class comes uh, comes in the morning on Saturday, and uh, our Linux class go further ahead, like, class from Evan or from 12 that's here with us like we just want to have both online classes on the same day oh. so like our class starts at 8 and it it finished by 12 30 and then we have to rush towards the uh, on-campus class at 2 30 most of the guys they are not near to the college so it's difficult for them you know to manage and uh, we normally when when the when our on-campus uh, class starts on saturday um, a majority of the guys they just reach by the class starts by twelve uh, by two thirty and most of them they just reach by three or three thirty. Okay. So basic idea behind yeah. yeah. I I got it. So I'm so right. Uh, email. I suggest that you also reach out to him. But then there will be some Saturdays, one Saturday in a month, where I have to attend a board meeting. In that is from uh, starts from 9 a.m. I believe. In that case, we will have to have an early Saturday class. Uh, that's that's okay. okay. It's okay. We can manage that. That's that's what we can like. We we can do. We can do it together. That's that's not a problem. So that means we might have to start like 7 a.m. in the morning for a class, which is I am okay with that one, right? Uh, if, it's, if it is once a month, it's okay. We'll manage it. No problem. <laughs> yeah, it's once a month. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I I understand the whole class is on board this thing. I will write Pritam and Neil that this is what they are suggesting. If your other instructor also agrees to delay their class or swap the class, then I can suggest 8 a.m. Uh, Saturday mornings as our last time. Yeah. We can start from 8 a.m. Uh, IP7 from yeah, we can, 8 a.m. to 12 uh, uh, class from so it is class from 8 to 10, and then you can have your Linux class from maybe afterwards, right? So I will write Pritam an email that this is the request that is coming from the students. Uh, happy to help you as much as I can. Okay, any other question? Now, okay, then I will see you next week virtually, and then maybe a week after we can have our midterm exam. So get get into that, that mindset that, that two weeks from now we are looking at our midterm exam. Okay. All right. Okay, guys, take care and have a. Thanksgiving to all who are celebrating and an extra holiday to a lot of people. Okay. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good night.